So today I'm going to talk about some big moves that have happened around New York sports recently. I don't make videos like this very often, but it was a very like unusual week for New York sports, talking about the Francisco Lindor trade with Carlos Carrasco. Then we're talking about James Harden to the Nets, which I talked about in a separate video. We won't be covering that here. Um, what else happened? Uh, DJ LeMay, of course, back with the Yankees was a big move. Corey Kluber just got signed by the Yankees like 45 minutes to an hour ago. Uh, Robert Sala to the Jets last night. So yeah, there's some big storylines in New York sports. I kind of just want to give my opinion out there and put a video out for you guys. I, I know majority of people that follow this channel are Giants fans, but I know I have some fans that enjoy my work that are Jets fans. My biggest fan on this channel is a Jets fan. You know who you are, but I have you know a Jets fan that likes me. Um, who else? I mean, we have some Mets fans, I'm sure. So I'm sure some of you can uh, enjoy this content. Both of you guys enjoy, and let's get into it. All right, so we'll start off with my Yankees first. We'll start with the DJ LeMahieu news. It was a six-year, $90 million contract. Now, LeMahieu's like 32. I want to get that right. I'm going to look it up real quick. I'm pretty sure LeMahieu's 32. Um, so yeah, he, he'll be around here until he's like 37 or so. He is 32. Okay, so he'll be around here for a little bit. But when you look at it like, you know, um, you know, salary per year, basically, let's salaries per year. But anyway, um, it's only $15 million per year. So it's like actually a really good deal. Yes, the longevity kind of scares you for the last two years and whatnot. But for the next three, four years, the uh, LeMayu contract for $15 million seems like a bargain. And when you look at it on like a uh, how much money he's making per year type basis, and we know how important, how vital DJ LeMahieu is to this Yankee lineup. The Yankee lineup has a lot of right-handers. I know he's a righty as well, but a lot of guys that strike out. And DJ LeMahieu is one of those guys that's very tough to strike out. So he kind of goes against what the rest of the lineup does. And he's a really good second baseman. I think he's won two or three gold gloves by now. So he's not just a great offensive player. As we know, he can play great defense. So he's great for Yankee Stadium. Great for this lineup at top of the order. I'm very happy to have him back. I was never, like, legitimately concerned about losing him. I know there was, like, the Blue Jays. They were kind of in the sweepstakes for him. The Mets kind of got their name in there. There was one other team, I think, that kind of got their name in there. But I wasn't, like, too concerned. I figured the uh, Yankees would not let him go. Uh, the Yankees would probably match any offer. But to get him for six years and $90 million... It's really not that bad. Like, he was making a little less than that just the contract before this. I forget what his contract before was. It might have been like a two-year, 20-something million dollar type deal. So he's not making much, much more. I figured LeMahieu can get himself 20-plus million dollars per year, but now we got him for 15. So, like, I'm very satisfied with that, honestly. <clears throat> for Corey Kluber... This one, um, I think mostly has had positive reviews. I'm a big Corey Kluber guy. I mean, you know, of course, I've watched him a lot with Cleveland because the Yankees played them in the playoffs one year, and I'm a big fantasy baseball guy, so of course I know about Corey Kluber, but it was a one-year, it was 10 or $11 million. I mean, either way, it's just a one-year deal. Uh, he's a two-time Cy Young winner, most recently in 2017, I believe. He will be 35 this season. He's 34 currently, but I think he'll be 35 by the time the season starts. He has not pitched over 36 innings since 2018, which is the concern. But you look at the injuries, it was a broken forearm back in 2019 where a line drive hit his forearm. I mean, you really can't prevent that. I just, I chalked that one up to bad luck. 2020's injury, which is where he signed with the Rangers on a one-year deal, pitched one inning, and then got hurt. That was like a shoulder tear or something, so that one's a bit more concerning. That one shows wear and tear, but if it's just one injury over his entire career that's really serious, I can live with that. I mean, you look back at this guy's numbers. I had it up before, but his numbers have been insane over the years. You know, so Corey Kluber, as I mentioned, two-time Cy Young winner. He's been, you know, he has history in the AL, of course. So, like, he's been a really good pitcher for a long time. And for the Yankees, he'll be a three or four guy. He'll be behind Garrett Cole and hopefully a healthy Luis Severino. Domingo Herman will be right there with him. And then Jordan Montgomery, Debbie Garcia, whichever one you want to put in there. But he's honestly had a great career, man. I'm looking at it right now um, from, what was it, 2013? on, I think. He had one bad year in there, I think it was. Let me look. So 2013, where he really broke out. He had 3.85 ERA, went 11-5. I guess 2014 was the big breakout year for him. Um, he won 18 games, lost 9. Then in 2015, he led the league in losses. That was just a bad luck year because his ERA was only 3.49. But from 2016 to 2018, he was dominant. Um, and as I, I tweeted this before, just two years ago, and this is, you know, 2018 feels like a long time ago because that was pre-pandemic, everything was normal in life. But 2018, he went 20-7, and seven, a 2.89 ERA, two complete games. He led the league with 215 innings pitched, only 179 hits allowed in those 215 innings. He had a, uh, you know, 7.5 hits per nine, one home run per nine. 
uh, led the league in uh, what was I guess last in the league, or he led the league in base on balls per nine. Was the best at it. I'll put. I don't know if it's least or best. But you get what I mean. He was really good at not walking guys and nine point three strikeouts per nine. That was just two years ago. He was the third uh, guy in Cy Young voting. So like. I, people might say he's washed up, and I get it, but he wasn't really a guy recently that's going to blow you away with like a 98-mile-per-hour fastball. That's just not really who, who Corey Kluber is. I think he has a great changeup, a great slider, a really good two-seamer as well. It's just the movement on his pitches that really gets him, you know, made him, made him the pitcher he is. So I'm not really too concerned about the uh, velocity. He'll throw 91-92. It's not really a concern for me. But if the movement on his pitches is still there, then I think this is a great signing. He has to stay healthy, of course. But if he does stay healthy, uh, the Yankees got themselves a really good three or four starter for only a one-year deal. So I'm very satisfied about that. Can't really complain. I was happy about that move. Uh, some people were debating him versus Tanaka. I prefer to Kluber. I was on the side of Kluber. I love Tanaka. He's been a great Yankee, but I just kind of see Tanaka's career going downhill. I mean, maybe I'm being pessimistic about it, but I just see Tanaka not ever being the guy he once was. I think Kluber actually has something left in the tank that he can offer. He had one you know, bad injury that does show wear and tear, as I mentioned, but one unlucky injury. So the past two years, I mean, one unlucky injury, one serious injury. And, you know, hopefully it's just one thing that can go away. And hopefully he comes back for 2021 and has a very healthy year and a very, very successful year. So it's fine with me. I mean, I know some people want Tanaka, but in my honest opinion, I prefer to Kluber. So I'm happy about this move. Now let's get on to the New York Mets. And they have made some news, you know, not just the Steve Cohen thing a couple months ago, but... They have actually uh, made some noise here. So the Francisco Lindor trade happened last week, I believe. I didn't make like an instant reaction to it. I mean, I'm sure a lot of other Mets fans had their reaction to it. But Lindor, as we know, he's a top two, three shortstop in baseball. You can say he's the best one in baseball. I would not argue argue you on that one. He's 27 years old, good power hitter, a really good power hitter for a shortstop. Um, I think he's had like 90 plus RBIs a couple years. Like he's, he's just amazing. I mean, he can hit in the middle of your order. He can hit... I mean, he could hit lead off, I guess, if he needed him to. He's not like the best on base percentage guy. He doesn't walk a ton, but at the same time, I prefer him as like a number three hitter or number two hitter, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he can steal some bases. I get that, but he has been a really good fielder. I think he won a gold glove one year as well. So, Lindor is only 27. Um, he should be a Met for a long time, hopefully. They reached that arbitration for $22 million. I think he's a free agent next year, so he'll probably get the bag as long as he like puts out a good performance for the Mets in 2021. He'll get himself a big type contract like a Mookie Betts type contract possibly where you know it's in like the 250 plus million dollar range we'll find out how good of a year he has but you know the Mets obviously don't want to let him walk they get Carlos Carrasco in return and Carrasco like Kluber had a stretch it wasn't the longest stretch to be like a Hall of Famer but Carlos Carrasco had a stretch where he was one of the you know, not best, but like, you know, he was a top 15 pitcher in baseball, Carlos Carrasco. Then unfortunately, he fell off one year. I think it was 2018. Then 2019 had cancer. And once he got rid of that, he came back this year, which, you know, was pretty ballsy, honestly. You know, it's it's in a pandemic and you're kind of more at high risk, but he came back and played for the Indians. Can I call them the Indians? I feel like they changed their name, but he played for the Indians in 2020. Had himself a nice year. Yes, I know it's a shortened season. It wasn't the full 162, but he had a nice year. Showed he's that guy that he used to be. Is he the same guy he was in 2015, 2016? Probably not. He's 33 now. But Car Carlos Carrasco can be a very, very solid number three starter for a team. And the Mets, of course, they still have guys. I mean, of course, Jacob DeGrom, they'll get Noah Syndergaard back hopefully in June or July. Marcus Stroman's still there. I'm probably forgetting somebody else. They signed Robert Gazel uh, Gazelman back. I think he's a bullpen guy now anyway. But still, the Mets have themselves a pretty good team. And I didn't mention the James McCann move. They got him for, I think it was four years, $40 million. I wanted my Yankees to get James McCann because I'm kind of over Gary Sanchez, honestly. I, I prefer to trade him if you watch my Yankees uh, offseason preference video. But James McCann is a really good player. Uh, he was one of the better players based on uh, baseball savant's stat of pitch framing. He was in the 92nd percentile, I believe, in pitch framing. And when you have a great rotation like the Mets do, that has the potential to be great. When you're stealing some strikes here and there, it can definitely you know go a long way. So his pitch framing can be a big thing for the Mets. And don't sleep on his bat. I know they sign Yasmani Grandal for the White Sox and McCann only had like 97 at bats last year I think it was but when he's up there at the plate he's no slouch he's not like 
I don't want to like crap on Wilson Ramos because he's actually a pretty good average hitter, but Wilson Ramos is not really the hitter that James McCann is. It's definitely an upgrade. So James McCann, when he's right, can hit you, you know, 15 plus home runs, 60 plus RBIs, hit over 280. Like he'll be a good hitter for you at the catcher position. So I like that move as well. Now, Brad Hand, this one came out this morning when I was at work. It seemed like a done deal. Then like a half hour later, some guys were retracting on it. I don't know if it was John Heyman or if it was the other guy that's pretty big. I forget the other guy's name. But uh, it was one of those guys that reported it. And the other one, or Ken Ken Rosenthal or John Heyman, I forget which one said it was a done deal. But whoever it was, um, the other guy said it wasn't a done, done deal. So we'll find out hopefully in the coming days about Brad Hand. But honestly, since like 2016, Brad Hand has been one of the better relievers in baseball. He was with the Padres, had a really good year. I think he was traded to Cleveland during like, you know, at the trade deadline then went to Cleveland had like three or four really good years in a row Uh, of course was a free agent this year he's probably he's not that young he's got to be like in his lower 30s probably but Brad Hand he's a you know I don't want to call him short I don't know how tall he is he's probably not even over six foot but he looks short he wears the high socks he doesn't throw hard but he has a really good breaking ball he probably throws 91 92 but Brad Hand finds ways to be a very successful pitcher so if the Mets can add him to a bullpen that has guys like Edwin Diaz and Dylan Batances and Seth Lugo. If he's a starter or reliever, we'll find out. But the Mets have themselves a pretty damn good bullpen on paper. I'm probably forgetting some names as well, but the Mets do have themselves. I just think the Mets have a good team. I'm being honest. Like I, I remember for my you know baseball prediction video, which I do every year, I had the Mets in fourth place, and I had some really really pissed off Mets fans in my comments about that. The Mets did finish in fourth place, and I did get it right. But I think this year coming up, I might have the Mets in the first or second place. I still fear the Braves but honestly the Mets might be the best team on paper in that division I'm not gonna lie we'll find out how I feel back you know once March or April comes around whenever I come out with that video but still I think the Mets are in a good spot and I heard someone say on the radio today it was a um, this was a seller's market there were a lot of teams that lost money of course over the past year due to the pandemic and the Mets were the buyers in a seller's market it's not every offseason you have a chance to get yourself a 27 year old you know stud shortstop because a team doesn't want to pay him. Like, I know Cleveland's not really big on paying their players, and that happened with Mookie Betts and the Red Sox a year prior. But when you're a buyer in a seller's market, when like more than half the league, I'm probably, I would say 90% of teams were sellers, and you're a buyer, it definitely bodes well for you as a Met fan or just, you know, Met GM, of course. I forget what the guy's name is. Something Porter, I think, they hired from the Diamondbacks. But um, still, they have Sandy Alderson as well. So, like, the Mets did a good job of taking advantage of an offseason where most teams are not buyers and they're one of the few teams that are so the Mets definitely put themselves in a much better position and I remember hearing the Mets want to build their roster I forget if Alderson said this or if it was Steve Cohen they want to build their team through the middle like I forget how they said it exactly but the catcher position pitching shortstop second base and center field like the middle of the diamond and so far they've kind of lived up to that promise they have James McCann now good pitching staff bullpen and starters you know, obviously one of the best shortstops in baseball now. Jeff McNeil, lefty, really good average hitter. And in center field, we'll find out what happens. Like, I don't think they want to put Conforto out there full time. Do they sign a George Springer? Do they sign a Jackie Bradley Jr.? Like, do they, what do they, you know, what route do they want to go? Because Jackie Bradley, better fielder, will cost less, but he's definitely not the hitter that George Springer is. I think the difference between the fielding is not as big as the hitting between those guys, if you know what I mean. Like, I think Springer's a much better hitter than Jackie Bradley as a fielder, if that makes sense. I feel like the drop-off is not as big with the uh, fielding as it is hitting. So, you know, if I can pick, you know, one of those guys in a vacuum, I'm obviously picking George Springer. But if it saves the Mets a lot of money, like let's say Springer's asking for five years and $150 million or something crazy like that, and Jackie Bradley wants a simple two-year and $30 million contract, then maybe they go the Jackie Bradley Jr. route, and you have yourself a really, really good defensive center fielder that can be a better hitter than a Juan Lagares was for the Mets back in the day. So I think that could be a, a good move. It's a lefty in the lineup as well. We'll see which way they go about it. <clears throat> and the final one here, the New York Jets signed uh, Robert Sala, a uh, former defensive coordinator for the 49ers, to a five-year deal. I was surprised by this. I mean, it came out last night at like 8:30. I thought the Jets were going to go offensive, uh, you know, uh, offensive head coach because you know they have the second overall pick. The rumors are out there that they want a quarterback. Now the rumors are out there that Sam Darnold's going to stick around for a year four. I think this is yeah, year four. So we'll find out what happens. But you know, they could go Penae Sewell, the offensive tackle, and have him and Becton on the same offensive line, which is very appealing, of course. But I guess we'll find out in April what happens or as more rumors come out. 
So Robert Sala does have some talent on this defense. And yes, your coaching can only go as far as your talent can take you. But you look at Quentin Williams, Marcus May, Brian Poole, I think is a pretty good slot corner that people sleep on. CJ Mosley is going to come back from COVID. I think Joe Douglas uh, announced that he'll be coming back, the former Ravens inside linebacker. Bryce Hall is a guy on the outside, a corner who was a draft pick in the fourth round this year, or fifth, I think it was a fourth rounder from Virginia, who I was a fan of. And he had a pretty decent year as a rookie. So we'll see how he progresses. He has potential. Now, Salah brought on Mike LaFleur, who is the younger brother, I guess, of Matt LaFleur, the current uh, Packers head coach. And uh, Mike LaFleur is 33 years old. He was the passing game coordinator for Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers. So you're talking about a team that has a great passing attack. And I know they didn't have the talent this year because George Kittle got hurt. Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt. Um, <clears throat> I think, who was it? Uh, Debo Samuel had a couple injuries this year. The Niners were definitely a team that faced a ton of injuries. And like, but offensively, Kyle Shanahan's one of the best offensive play callers in the football. So when you have a young Michael LaFleur, who I think a lot of people like around the NFL, bring him in, a young offensive mind who, you know, learning under Kyle Shanahan for the past few years, when you see that happen every day, it's like, wow, what can I take from him and put it in my offense? So I think he'll actually have a good offense. I'm excited to see what type of route concepts and what type of philosophy he has. There was a lot of good play action plays and rollouts for the 49ers offense. Obviously, they were a very good running team. So we'll find out what he brings to that Jets offense next year and what type of personnel they have. Do the Jets have a second franchise tackle? Do they have a new franchise quarterback? Who do they sign at wide receiver? Tight end is a big need for the Jets as well. We'll find out, but the Jets definitely have a lot of great possibilities there. For Robert Sala himself, I made a video about him last year when he was a Giants uh, coaching candidate. I forget if the Giants interviewed him. I feel like they did. I don't know now. I feel like they probably did, though. Um, but I made a video about him. He's a very interesting guy. Seems like a really good dude. There's a good story about him. I saw it on like YouTube. On, like one of, It was like a news station that did a video about it. And I think Robert Sala, once his brother was actually in one of the towers during 9-11. And his family didn't know for eight hours, I think it was, if his brother was even alive or not. And, you know, he, he basically kind of just had like this realization that like, you know, life is short and you should probably do what you want. I think Robert Sala had like this very solid job in finance, making a good amount of money, but he wasn't happy. He was doing it for the money. And then Robert Sala just said to himself back in 2001, like, what am I doing here? Like, I want to be happy. So he got himself in the coaching. He made a lot less money. He said at one point he was making $5 per hour as an intern for the uh, Texans, I believe it was. But at the same time, he worked himself up, went to the Seahawks, I believe it was. Uh, who else? Uh, the Niners, of course. There might have been one other team in there, I feel like. But he went to a few teams, of course, worked his way up the rankings. And eventually, I think Kyle Shanahan promised him a couple years prior, maybe, to um, when he was on the Niners staff, to, that he would give him a defensive coordinator interview uh, if they had a job opening. And, uh, you know, he was a man of his word, Kyle Shanahan. He gave him the interview and he got the job. And ever since uh, Robert Sala took over, they've been a really good defense. I think they were 24th was the worst they had uh, under him. And then the next year they were like, you know, top 10. Then it was like number two or something last year. So they had a good defense under him or they've had really good defenses under him. So he's, he has a great attitude. I think he's a very likable guy. Players like Richard Sherman, who's not afraid to speak his mind, came out and said they really liked him. So, you know, if a guy like that likes you, it says a lot. Richard Sherman's now 33 or something like that. So he's been around for a long time, been around a lot of coaches. So when he says he likes you, I definitely take that as a, uh, not just as a grain of salt, I take that as a very solid opinion. So... Very likable guy. Uh, he's one of those guys that commands respect. He's not going to let players walk all over him, I feel like. You know, he has like this, I don't want to say intimidating, like, you know, I think he's like one of the most jacked coaches in football, though. Like, honestly, like that guy's biceps are huge. And like, I don't know, I just feel like he comes off as a pretty intimidating coach, not going to let players walk all over him, probably my way or the highway type of guy. But at the same time, he definitely seems like a personable guy that wants to get to know you and, and build relationships with players. Like, I don't think he'll just bark out orders or be like a robot like an Adam Gase was. I feel like he'll be a personable guy that will uh, relate to players and kind of build relationships with them. So I feel like connecting with players, he'll be good at that. He's only 41 years old, so he's, he's probably like more relatable to the younger generation, not to say that Adam Gase was too old. But at the same time, Adam Gase was not, you know, a relatable guy, to be honest with you. So he's upbeat. He brings energy. Um, as I said, the complete opposite of Adam Gase and Todd Bowles. Uh, Todd Bowles was just like a quiet, awkward type dude. Adam Gase was just 
he was Adam Gase. I mean, let's be honest. He was not anything special personality-wise. And I'm not sure if Robert Sala will work out because it ultimately depends on how Joe Douglas and Robert Sala draft for the Jets and you know what type of players they bring in there. But if he ever gets the talent, I feel like this could work out. But at the same time, I can sit here and say the Jets had themselves or, or had themselves a really good person as their head coach. And you really not to say Todd Bowles was a bad person. I'm sure he's great, but like you know. Um, for um, what's his name, Adam Gase, a lot of people didn't really like him. Let's be honest. I mean, I, I can say this time with confidence, the Jets have themselves a very likable, very good guy as a head coach. I saw Quentin Williams is very happy about um, the hiring. He tweeted about it. I think a couple other Jets players were happy about it. So seeing the reaction from the players in a positive uh, way was definitely good to see. So I mean, I think Jets fans will be pretty excited about this. I've not really heard a Jets fan have a bad. Uh, reaction to this, but I guess we'll find out how it plays out. No one can sit here and say right now if Robert Sala will be here for a decade and be a successful coach, but if he ever gets the talent, I feel like he will, so we'll find out. But I think that's it. Of course, I didn't include the James Harden stuff. I made a video about that, as I mentioned before, but that will do it. Some Yankees, Mets, Jets stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, no Giants. It's been kind of quiet with the Giants, honestly. Jason Garrett is a finalist for the Chargers um, head coaching job, so Keep praying for that to happen, honestly, so that would be good. Um, but if not, I feel like Jason Garrett will be, will be back here, unfortunately. But anyway, I think that'll do it. Um, i trying to think about the Giants. I feel like nothing else has came out, really. The Knicks, what's going on with the Knicks? Nothing much is going on with the Knicks. They're kind of reverting back to their old Knicks ways, but the Nets beat them the other night. I was happy to see that. But, yeah, that'll do it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Leave your reactions about the big news that happened in New York. Which moves are you happy about? Are you not happy about? Did you like Corey Kluber? Not like it? LeMahieu, I'm sure everyone loved. Do you think Robert Sala will, uh, will work out with the Jets? And all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you guys enjoyed, and I'll talk to you next time.